our grandchildren's future. Here we go. I have a fear. So this first slide, I did not write. I took this from the slides for Professor Chetty's course. And Raj Chetty is such a great economist. And even though he's 13 years younger than me, he's one of my heroes. Uh, so uh, the points that I took from this slide is economists are always studying trade-offs. We can't preserve the world exactly the way it was um, a thousand years ago. We're always facing trade-offs at the margin, and I'll give some specific examples in a moment. Economists and empirical economists are always thinking about for every action, even attending this lecture this morning, what are the benefits and what are the costs? And if the costs of an action are high, how do we recreate the rules of the game in capitalism to do a better job protecting the environment as the economy grows? There continue to be billions of poor people around the world, and I believe they have the right to grow richer. How do we do better setting up the rules of the game so that as they grow richer, there's less pollution? One of the themes I'm gonna emphasize is this second point today. I believe with the climate change challenge, we both need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but we also need to prepare to adapt to the climate change challenge. And I'll have some things to say about that today. So an example that was provided to me in the notes that I were shared with me is what we think of building a new pipeline or permitting fracking with any action. And the Biden administration made a ruling on the Keystone pipeline. Um, it's the job of economists to think about the benefits and the costs of a public policy. Today, I'm going to be focusing on what we know about environmental damage. Um, what are the intended and unintended consequences of every action people, governments, and firms take? When Amazon HQ2 opens up in Arlington, Virginia, um, do they have a green building which they've built? Why did they build such a green building? Will it have a low carbon footprint? These are the kinds of microeconomics of the environment that I'm always thinking about. So folks, as many of you know, a very important idea in microeconomics is the concept of externalities. Externalities can sometimes be positive. If a university hires a great young person who's a great scholar, her mentoring of other people, she may not be paid for that mentoring, but she's having a positive externality on the organization she's part of. Environmental economists emphasize the negative externalities associated with capitalism. If you drive a dirty car, that creates pollution, and that can raise local particulate levels in the area where you live and drive. It's very important to think about how do we incentivize economic actors to take into account the social costs of their actions. So if you buy a cigar, economics tells us that the private benefits exceed the private costs, but you have no incentive to recognize the social costs you impose on everyone else. With that idea in mind, let's return to a familiar demand curve from microeconomics. Folks, was this the highlight of your life? So we've got price on the vertical axis, and we've got gallons of gasoline on the horizontal axis, and demand curves slope down. And this brilliant curve tells us if the price of gas is three, then aggregate demand is 150, measured in billions of units. Um, what I want you thinking about is this, the social cost of gasoline. So a key point that environmental economists make is someone like Exxon faces a cost of producing gasoline. What interests environmental economists is the social cost. So do you see that the social cost of gasoline equals a dollar, four minus three equals one. When gasoline is produced, the firm has to go find the oil. It has to turn gas oil into gasoline. It has to ship it to the gas stations. But the firms like Exxon ignore the social cost of gasoline, the extra greenhouse gas emissions, and the local air pollution associated with producing and consuming gasoline. Most environmental economists are thinking about how do we use big data to estimate the social cost of every activity? We could estimate the social cost of eating a hamburger. We could, eat, we could estimate the social cost of producing a Dell computer. For everything you do in your life, what is the externality? How do we quantify that? That's the job of the data scientist. And then if that turns out to be large, 
How do we change the rules of the game to reduce that externality so that your grandchildren have a more sustainable future? Folks, with that in mind, I want to talk about the social cost of pollution and climate change. Folks, this is an important graph to me, and I realize it's a little bit busy. Do you see that time goes from 1955 to the year 2020, and on the vertical axis is the concentration of carbon dioxide emissions? What I see is almost a linear function. This is the global atmospheric parts per million. And notice, despite all of the solar panels, despite all of the green technology we're introducing, there's this very ugly fact that we have not bent the curve, that global greenhouse gas concentrations have been rising linearly since before I was born for 65 years now. I'm very worried that despite all of Greta Thunberg's activism, and despite the New York Times celebrating that we're on the verge of a green economy, I'm actually very worried that, that this is just going to keep rising. Uh, at least over the last 65 years, we have not bent this curve. This, these are data, and the slope has been constant. I'm very worried that if we don't bend this curve, there can be enormous social costs from climate change. Let me put up all of these points and let you look at them. I have been a little bit of a bad boy in environmental economics, arguing I'm a fan of the green economy. I support what uh, Joe Biden is doing on the green economy. Uh, hopefully we can chat about that. I'm very worried that world carbon dioxide emissions will continue to grow. World emissions are a product of three terms, global population, global gross national product, and technology, greenhouse gas emissions per dollar of GNP. I call this the great race between quantity and quality of economic activity. Because the world's population is growing and because the world's poor nations are developing, global GNP is rising. These first two terms are growing more quickly than emissions per dollar of GNP are falling. And that's what I mean about the race between quantity and quality. I am excited that India and China may use less coal in the future for their grid. And I'm aware that we're decarbonizing the grid. I'm aware my family owns a Tesla. I'm aware that there are electric vehicles. But, uh, but the, the, the demand for energy in the developing world, the growth in demand for energy is huge. And folks, if this interests you, I strongly encourage you to read these three papers. Catherine Wolfram and her co-authors wrote a great paper that's accessible to you guys, and I'd be happy to chat with you. And so I'm very worried that global greenhouse gas emissions will continue to rise. And this is one of the reasons I've started to think about the climate change adaptation challenge. Folks, here's another graph. This is a graph per person. That's what I mean by per capita. This is a graph per person of world carbon dioxide emissions. And what you see here is the world is in circles. So the world is releasing about four tons per person. And that's been roughly constant. So this has not been declining. Notice that India, the squares, has very low per capita emissions. And notice China. China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. China is the triangle line. Do you see the change in the slope of China's emissions over time per person as it became this production juggernaut in the 2000s? This is part of my worry that with economic development comes more greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the rate of poverty in India and China has declined, but an unintended consequence of the rise in India and China's economies is an increase in carbon dioxide emissions. Many empirical economists have explored the association between climate change and weather extremes and economic outcomes. It's very important to estimate these reduced form relationships because if we because they play the Paul Revere effect. Let me show you a couple of examples of these. Um, by Paul Revere, um, I mean that guy from American history who told us that the British were coming. Where, where big data scientists are really useful is by helping people, including me, uh, to understand the unintended consequences 
of what we have collectively unleashed with rising greenhouse gas emissions. So folks, what I'm about to do is I want to link going in the wrong direction. I want to link, how does this trend impact your quality of life? Here's picture number one. Wolfram Shankler and Michael Roberts are two very high quality economists. Maze is corn. Folks, what these guys want you thinking about is the following. On this graph, on the x-axis is hourly temperature measured in Celsius, not Fahrenheit. On the vertical axis is the log of corn production. Guys, do you see that when temperature is above like 28 degrees Celsius, do you see this nonlinear relationship? So Maya, I'm looking at you as my representative, talented listener. Do you see that this falls off a cliff? And so, and so folks, I am... I'm having a senior moment, 28 degrees Celsius might be, it might be like 85 degrees Fahrenheit, I need help there. But, but uh, notice this is a nonlinear relationship. This is what the economists are doing. We're, we're correlating economic activity with weather extremes. So if climate change increases the risk of weather extremes, and if weather extremes affect our production and quality of life, then climate change affects our quality of life. It, this is a transitive argument. So folks, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures like these of this. This is the Paul Revere effect. Schenkler and Roberts are teaching us if we fail to adapt and thus farmers face many more days of higher than 30 degrees Celsius, we're going to have this reduction in it, 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 we're, we're going to have this reduction in output. I think this is very important work. Folks, here's another one. Um, my friend Josh Graf Zibin of UC San Diego and co-authors, they're studying how children learn at school. And what they want you to see is when children are studying in hotter places, they learn less. So there's a new literature called Heat and Learning of when students study in places that don't have access to good air conditioning and poor people have less access to good air conditioning, when poor children study in places that are hotter, they're learning less. And so this is a horrible finding, but it's very important that big data researchers have documented this finding. And uh, th this is crucial work, which if this interests you guys, there's all sorts of research possibilities in this big data age for you to work on. Here's another example. So folks, um, I'm on social media, and as an older gentleman, I always try to be a gentleman, even when there are debates and disagreements. Um, and, and notice, do you see that this is another graph of the same flavor? On the horizontal axis, we have daily maximum temperature in Celsius. And on the ver vertical axis, we have some measure. I did not write this paper. We have some measure of using profanity on social media. And the causal story these researchers want to tell is when it gets hot outside, people get really angry and they use more profanity on social media. I just published a paper in the Journal of Public Economics documenting we've always known that there's more violent crime in poor neighborhoods. We've always known that on hot days, there's more violent crime. I wrote a paper in the Journal of Public Economics that I'll put in the chat room during our discussion that the correlation between violence in high poverty neighborhoods is even higher on hot days. And our story for that is that poor neighborhoods don't have air conditioning. People live in close physical proximity. They don't have air conditioning. And on very hot days, people are angry and their temper is revving up. And, uh, and so I've been writing papers of this flavor. Folks, I can't see my own heading here. Folks, is this the suicide graph? I actually can't see the top. Uh, we can't see the uh, top either, but it says uh, relative risk of mortality. Um, thank you. Uh, so, thank you. So this is another example. So I've shown you that quality of life is lower. And this is another graph showing that when it's very hot, um, it, it, there's excess mortality risk here. And so this is an example of what researchers are up to here. Folks, I published a book just a few months ago from Yale University Press titled Adapting to Climate Change. And a key theme in the book is that we are not 
passive victims. We have unleashed climate change. We, Mother Nature is throwing harder punches at us. The wildfires in the American West, the Texas freeze, sea level rise in Florida, the floods in Germany, the floods in China recently, the floods in India, the risks of these events are rising. What my book is about is that we are not passive victims here. What do we do in the face of when we, when we know that we don't know the threats that climate change will pose, what do we do to protect ourselves and our loved ones? A point in my book is that we are better able to protect ourselves because we're urbanizing. Farmers tend to be poorer and tend to be, their income tends to be very tied to weather conditions. Um, as we've learned with Zoom, urbanites can be productive even if they can't go to work. Urbanization is an adaptation strategy. If richer people have much greater capacity to adapt to climate threats, purchasing a great air conditioner, living in a safe place, fly, uh, uh, migrating to higher ground if they need to. Human capital, the mind and skill is another theme in my book. Climate change is gonna pose many problems for us to solve. An example, um, th there was a young teenager I read about who's developed a, 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 a fire extinguisher that can be attached to homes. It has a sensor and it goes off if there's fire near your house. And so that's an example of human capital of creating a new product to reduce a home's fire risk. There's an open question how successful that product will be, but I'm impressed with his ingenuity. Economists would say we need market price signals. If water is more scarce in the American West, we need water prices to rise to signal that scarcity, and then people will economize on their water use, and farmers would use less water for water-intensive crops like alfalfa. And innovation. I'm a big fan of human ingenuity, uh, of uh, Zoom is an example of an innovation. If the COVID shock had hit our economy 15 years ago of the extra damage it would have done versus in our Zoom economy that we can meet like this, I don't want you to say this crazy con thinks that this alone will help us to adapt to climate change. The research agenda is to think about that we're not passive victims. How do we use our different strategies to flatten the curves that I showed you in these graphs. And for us to be scientists here to continue to measure these over time. And I'll speak about that in a moment. The empirical test of adaptation is whether each decade do we see a decline in the correlation between damage when mother nature throws a, a shock at us, a hundred degree day, a terrible flood, does that cause less damage over time? Are there fewer deaths from natural disasters now per capita than in the past? That's the time series test. The cross-sectional test of adaptation to climate change is if richer people and richer places suffer less than poorer people in poorer places when a natural disaster occurs. Folks, here's an example. What, what the researchers in this project are doing is the following. They're asking, the, the mustard line is from 1960 to 2004. The red line is from 1930 to 1959. On the horizontal axis is a measure of how hot in Fahrenheit, not Celsius, how hot it is outside. On the vertical axis is mortality. And guys, what you're supposed to see here is evidence of adaptation. Do you see in the graph that when in, in the modern period, the, that the mustard line, when it's very hot, the mustard line lies below the red line. So when it's very cold and when it's very hot, we suffer less death. So folks, that's evidence to an economist of adaptation. In the Ross Chetty big data tradition, we are, we're looking at the same reduced form correlation structure, the correlation between outdoor temperature and death rates in the early period, 1929 to 1959, versus the later period. And evidence of adaptation is that we're suffering less from the shock. We're still suffering. Uh, evidence of perfect adaptation would be if the mustard line was at zero. It's not at zero. Uh, we, uh, and so this is an example of what empirical environmental economists are doing to estimate the externality consequences, in this case measured in lost lives, from climate change. So um, 
an optimist can look at this figure and say, we're making progress. Uh, and it's, it's likely, especially the rich are making progress at, in the modern period of facing less death risk from, and this matters because mother nature is raising the probability of extreme hot weather days. Folks, here's another example. What the authors are doing here is they're studying mortality around the world. And what you're supposed to see is India, a poorer country than the United States, is, is suffering more deaths on hot days than the US. And, that, and so what you're supposed to take away here is a benefit to richer countries. There's sort of some sad irony. Rich countries have contributed more greenhouse gas emissions and thus have caused climate change. But rich countries suffer less death risk from climate change because income allows you to adapt. Um, and, and so I think this is an important figure that needs to be updated. If air conditioning becomes cheaper in India, the India red line would converge closer to the US line. And as India grows richer also, more people would adopt air conditioning and these lines would converge. Folks, um, Solomon Chang and his co-author wrote an interesting paper about deaths from cyclones. On, on the horizontal axis is not temperature anymore. It's the cyclone's wind speed measured, in, I believe, in meters per, per second. And on the vertical axis is the log of the count of people killed by these natural disasters divided by the population, so the death rate. Folks, what you're supposed to see here is Japan, a rich nation, suffers much less. Uh, draw a vertical line, draw a vertical line like at, at a maximum wind speed of 20. And you see that relative to Vietnam and the Philippines, Japan suffers much less from Mother Nature's punch. And, and, and this is the evidence that income insulates you from Mother Nature's shocks. A benefit of economic development is to face less risk from Mother Nature's shocks. And economists keep studying this. An environmental justice person should, should ask, why is Vietnam suffering more from these shocks? What actions could Vietnam take to suffer less? So yes, part of it is growing richer, but what other rules of the game would better protect Vietnamese people from the next cyclone? This is how big data analysis informs climate change adaptation and protecting people. Two more slides before I break. We, political economy and Joe Biden, we will be better able to adapt to climate change if we reduce our aggregate greenhouse gas emissions. The good news is ideas are public goods. Once Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook, the whole world could adopt it. Um, I have in a couple of papers here, which if you read, I'd be happy to speak to you. Um, a, point that, a point that progressives make is that suburbanites have been slow to embrace the low carbon agenda. In my paper with Stephen and Magali, we argue that as Tesla makes progress in producing electric vehicles and selling solar panels, if the suburbs of the United States decarbonized, this would actually increase the support for carbon taxes. The economics of taxes is simple. People oppose taxes when they're aware that, they're, that they'll have to pay for it. Someone who lives a low carbon life in San Francisco is both an environmentalist, but they produce a very small carbon footprint and won't have to pay a high tax if we tax carbon. Somebody in the Houston suburbs who has a large carbon footprint will have much lower income if we have a carbon tax because of their carbon intensive life. Magali, Stephen, and I argue that if suburbanites adopt Teslas and solar panels because they're high quality products, this will decarbonize the suburbs and even they will start to vote for low carbon legislation, perhaps even the Green New Deal. And so I want you young people thinking about when you meet somebody who opposes carbon pricing, why? And what innovations, what role can Elon Musk play in shifting American carbon politics such that we become a leader in decarbonizing? Maya, I want to stop there and let you open up the floor. All right. So there's been a lot of discussion in the chat, but I pulled out a couple highlights for questions. Um, so one is, is it any coincidence that some of the wealthiest, most well-functioning economies coupled with low crime rates and high education exist in the coldest parts of the world? Well, that's an excellent question. 
I want to acknowledge that. I have nothing smart to add. Uh, but but I, what I love about the question is there are so many open puzzles for young people to work on. Um, but I have nothing smart there to add, so I'm just going to be quiet. All right. Um, we can have direct questions. Um, if you did ask a question in the chat and you'd like to share it uh, via raised hand, that would be great. Um, why don't we go to Pranav? Hi, uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much, first of all. And uh, my question was just focused on like that kind of aspect of the mortality graph. So I thought it was really interesting, but I was wondering like um, how they kind of make that graph because I was wondering like, do, does it consider a lot of those like, you know, confounding variables, for example, like over these years, you know, medical innovations um, and stuff like that often have changed in a lot of, when we look at it from like a yearly sense from a while back. So is it is it focusing only on like, individual days um, or is it focusing oftentimes on this more longitudinal perspective that can be a little bit problematic so you nailed it um, in social science we tend to be reductionistic i don't know if that's a word you are right that many things are simultaneously changing at the same time so to build you guys are good if medical care is improving in India over time, then if these guys remade this graph, the red line would shift down everywhere. Um, and so I think uh, I'm trying to control my screen. Uh, so one of the things I love about your comment, uh, it, I should have been pointing to this one, is you're saying, Matt, why has the curve shifted down from 1920, from the red line to the orange line? And you're saying many things have changed. You're being an excellent social scientist. These guys, these guys are modest in what they want you to take away from this graph. What they really want you to take away is when it's very hot, fewer people are dying, but they're not telling you why few, fewer people are dying. You guys can be better citizens and, and better researchers if you can make progress on that why question. An issue in Professor Chetty's big data course is it's often terrific at identifying patterns. What the next step in research is why. Uh, my other questions, you guys are good. Yes, uh, let's go to Rashi. Hi, I have a two part question. Um, do you think that the best way to address climate change would be through government policy? And then following up on that, do you think carbon taxes and cap and trade programs will be feasible in the future? I, since I know that I don't know the answers, I support launching a thousand experiments here. Esther DeFlo won the Nobel Prize two years ago for her work on field experiments. I think we need to implement many more field experiments. I'm a fan of piloting carbon taxes. I'm working with the World Bank right now on thinking about which... I want to make sure that the middle class in different countries support the low carbon agenda. Guys, there was the French yellow vest protests where rural people in France opposed carbon taxes because it raised local gasoline prices. I want many different experiments launched to see how we're gonna decarbonize our economy. So uh, that's the end of, um, your question is crucial, but I know that I don't know the answer. So the key is to experiment. Great question. Um, let's go to Tasmia. Uh, thank you. Also, this is a really important, wonderful lecture, which brought up my question that um, big corporations play one of the biggest roles in all of these like, greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason why that there's such a struggle for implementing carbon taxes is because big corporations wouldn't be like, um, would not approve of that. So what can we as individuals do in order to like combat these climate change and um, maintain sustainability because oftentimes individuals do care about climate change and we want to make change. However, most of the time we don't think about the social costs of our actions and our actions don't match up to our intent or what we say about um, trying harder to make change for our world and everything. So what can individuals do in order to actually do things that have an effect instead of like always relying on governmental policies because bills and legislations um, oftentimes don't pass or sometimes it takes quite a long time to pass. I love this question. M M M Maya, were you able to email our students my, my textbook, Fundamentals of Environmental and Urban Economics? Uh, 
uh, we posted it on our platform, Edmodo. So, so, so folks, I have one entire chapter devoted to that excellent question I was just asked. And it, I need to cough, I apologize. <coughs> In that chapter, I discuss young people. Um, folks, let me start with Tesla. I do not believe that Elon Musk created the Tesla and improves the Tesla to stop climate change. I think he wants to be a billionaire. I think he wants to be a trillionaire. But if the Tesla attracts, uh, um, Magali and I originally called our paper accidental environmentalists. If there's guys who would have purchased a Mercedes a, 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 a gasoline-fired Mercedes, but because the Tesla is a better car, they substitute from the Mercedes to the Tesla. They reduce their carbon footprint, not because they respect Greta Thunberg, but they're producing, they're buying their favorite car that happens to be an electric car. We call them accidental environmentalists. And so one way for consumers to vote their pocketbook to go greener is for low carbon products, the impossible burger, solar panels, electric vehicles to outperform their, their dirty counterpart products um, on non-environmental factors. A golf cart is a low carbon product, but nobody wants to drive that on the highway. It doesn't have enough power. Folks, in my textbook, I talk about the following. You guys can change capitalism if you vote your pocketbook for green products, if you work for companies, whether it's a Ben and Jerry's, or, or if you work for companies that are committed to low carbon agenda and th that are competing with high carbon incumbent products. If you, as you make money, if you invest your savings in mutual funds that have a corporate sustainable bottom line, this is how you as citizens, as the future leaders of our planet, can use capitalism to green capitalism, even if government is just um, spaced out and not doing anything. And so a whole chapter of my book, Fundamentals of Environmental and Urban Economics, is devoted to that last question of how young people can green capitalism through consumer patterns, who you work for, how you vote your portfolio, and that's not even talking about voting in politics. Uh, folks, can we take one more hand and then I'm going to do the air pollution and then we're going to do this again. Uh, Maya, please help me. Yeah. Um, let's go for the last question. Let's go to John. So recently, uh, and I think this has been a trend that's been going quite some time now, uh, as we see um, China begin to move towards uh, a more surface-based economy and with more labor being exported to other countries such as Vietnam, how do you think this will impact uh, GHG uh, emissions throughout the world uh, and within Asia specifically? I love this question and I'm in talks with the World Bank. The technical word for what John just uh, posed is called leakage. And let me give an example. We know that China wants to be part of the green economy. In my book with Sichi, we argue that there's several reasons for that. Uh, but if China tightens its environmental regulations, when we see its dirty production just move to a pollution haven, Vietnam, if that occurs, then China's emissions decline. But as John alluded to, world emissions don't decline. So folks, do you see that spatial substitution effect? The pollution haven hypothesis posits that as rich countries ratchet up their emissions, footloose, dirty activity, manufacturing activity, migrates to the developing world. This creates jobs and lowers poverty in the developing world, but it pollutes the developing world. It is my hope that if dirty factories move from China to Vietnam, would it be possible for Vietnam through technology transfer to have cleaner factories using Korean, German, or Chinese technology to lower emissions per unit of activity. That would be that would be the solution here. My mother would my mother's a lawyer and she's saying, Matthew, no magical thinking. You know, what are you, Matthew, gonna do? Yes, Matthew, you've documented that when China ratchets ratchets up its regulation, dirty manufacturing leaves. But what are you gonna do as an economist to guarantee that the new factories that open up in Laos? in Vietnam are clean, are cleaner, or that they're not using the old technology. And I think that's a very important issue. And I'm working with World Bank teams on that very issue. So thank you. These are great questions. Guys, I now want to talk about air pollution, and I want to talk about Janet Curry. 
Air pollution, we're, 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 no looking, we're no longer talking about climate change. We're talking about air pollution from cars, from forest fires. Um, in the American West and throughout the United States, we've been suffering from these fires caused by climate change uh, and by drought and extreme heat and by the management practices of the American, uh, the, the people who have some control over the forests. PM 2.5 particulate matter both causes morbidity and mortality. Folks, a horrible fact from India. Kirk Smith was a major Berkeley scholar who died two years ago, and his research focused on how to reduce indoor air pollution in India from cooking with coal and dirty fuels. And he argued that a million people die a year in India just from, from pollution exposure, uh, from indoor air pollution. Just horrible. China for years has had very high particulate levels as it has burned coal and as its rising vehicle fleet has been burning dirty gasoline. Folks, uh, China, as China does, oh, this is a graph on the horizontal axis is time going from the year 1990 to the year 2012. And on the vertical axis are millions of tons of coal consumption. The triangle line is the, the rest of the world, the whole world minus China. Folks, do you see this convergence between China and the rest of the world? So in 1990, China was using much less coal than the rest of the world. And notice how the two lines converge by 2012. Part, a large part of China's air pollution came from its consumption of energy and burning coal is dirty stuff. Folks, I do a lot of work on China. Let me explain this picture because it's a little bit busy. On the x-axis, uh, PM10 is, uh, is, is a measure of air pollution, particulate matter. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're asking across China's 85 largest cities, how much air pollution are Chinese urbanites exposed to? And to keep this simple, let's focus on the triangle line. Some good news here. In the year 2003, um, PM10 exposure was at, at roughly 118. Well, by the year 2012, it had fallen by like 40%, 30% to like 90. And so during a time of economic growth, what I want you to take away from this picture is the following. During a time when China cities grew in population and where Chinese urbanites grew richer, air pollution declined in China. There is this possibility of environmental progress under capitalism. So folks, again, the, 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 the time trend here is negative, despite the fact that Chinese cities are growing in population and are growing richer. Coming back to that quality versus quantity race, emissions per air pollution emissions intensity in China, measured as air pollution per dollar of Chinese GDP, is falling faster than the economy is growing. And I think this is great news, but of course, China still is polluted. Folks, here's another graph from Beijing. In this graph, time goes from the year 2000 to the year 2012. And on the vertical axis is PM10. Folks, for, as a point of comparison, Los Angeles, and Los Angeles can be a polluted city. Los Angeles has an average air pollution level of 40. Do you see that in the early 2000s, Beijing's air pollution level was like at 160? That's nasty stuff. Folks, I want to point out something. Do you remember the Beijing Olympics in 2008? Um, uh, I do. I, I watched a whole bunch of those Olympics. So, guys, did you know that the Chinese government, which is based in Beijing, shut down all the factories during the Olympics. And so do you see, do, for those of you interested in big data, do you see in 2008 that there is a sharp drop in air pollution in the city? Um, I, I guess I can't point to this. I, I, or maybe, uh, I'm, I'm not good enough. And I hope you see that in the middle of 2008, during the Olympics, that air pollution basically reaches its minimum. What's interesting is, is after the Olympics, pollution was on a new lower level. If you did a statistical test there called the Chow test, you would see that, that the Olympics actually led to a permanent break in air pollution. And so this is an example that when a government is incentivized to be active in, in reducing emissions, especially in... A, in a state with the power like the Chinese, you can dramatically improve air quality. But there's no free lunch. 
there would be winners and losers from this Im improvement in air quality. And it's the job of a microeconomist to measure these winners and losers and to see unintended consequences, like that example of Vietnam's pollution potentially rising as China ratchets, ratchets up its environmental regulation. Folks, in the last part of my lecture, I want to talk a little bit about um, how environmental economists go about evaluating regulations. And Maya, can I ask you a question? Have you and the students had many presentations on difference differences in before after comparisons? Not in particular, I think. Okay. Give me a second. And I, th this picture is actually really interesting. And, and thank you for telling me that. Folks, the, a fundamental question in economics is how is studying causality? How do we know what causes what? How do we know that smoking causes cancer? So if we see somebody who has cancer and they smoke, to an economist, the key counterfactual is, would he have had cancer if he hadn't smoked? Folks, is that point clear? So if you hang out with a bunch of PhD economists, they're always saying to each other, what's the counterfactual? So if you meet a brilliant person from Harvard, did Harvard cause that person to be brilliant? To answer that question, you need to know the counterfactual. What would she have achieved had she not gone to Harvard? But folks, do you see the problem? Um, do, because people don't have a twin. So if we had pairs of twins and one goes to Harvard and one goes to Ohio State, um, we could use, if they randomly decided which of the two twins went to Harvard and which went to Ohio State, and if we compared subsequent life outcomes for the two twins, do you see how that variation could be quite useful? To, I realize it's not such an interesting question to ask, does Harvard improve one's life? But now let's turn to this. What the researchers want to know, guys, let me help, help everyone. I'm getting too excited. In the year 1971, Richard Nixon was the president. Maya, was anyone here? Am I the only person who was alive in 1971? Yes. Oh, I'm the grandpa. Oh, but I was five years old, so it wasn't like I was 50 then. Um, so in the year, Republican Richard Nixon in 1971 created the Clean Air Act. And what and what the Clean Air Act did, folks, America, the United States can be partitioned into 3,000 counties. Those counties that were dirty, like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they were assigned to non-attainment status. Non-attainment status is a fancy word for high regulation, that they're going to face high regulation. Maya, do you see in the year 1969, do you see that for the non-attainment counties, their average particulate level was 92.1. And so in the year 1969, 69 stands for 1969. Time goes from 1967 to 1974. Guys, do you see in the year 1969, the counties assigned to high regulation on average were very polluted with a mean of 92.1. The counties who were not regulated had lower pollution. The US government, it's costly to regulate an area. So the US government focused regulation on high polluted places. The places that were not regulated on average had a pollution level of 57.3 in 1969. Maya, can I call on you again? I'm grateful to you. So do you, do you see that gap that the US government chose to regulate the polluted places? The whole point of a difference in difference estimator is to do a before after comparison for those who are regulated versus those who aren't. So guys, regulation shouldn't have any effect on places that are not regulated, ignoring that Vietnam point. So do you see that in the places that were never regulated, the control before, control after? So this is a treatment control comparison, but there isn't random assignment of the treatment. For those of you who know your medicine of randomized drug trials, you have a treatment group and you have a control group, and the treatment is assigned at random. In the case of the Environmental Protection Agency, there's a treatment group of counties and a control group of counties, but the treatment is assigned to the dirty counties and not assigned to the clean counties. Guys, do you see for the clean counties that basically they're trending down, but it's a flat curve. Well, look at the upper two panels. Do you see the treatment before and the treatment after? And you can do a before versus after comparison. Do you see that air pollution falls sharply in the treatment after group? What 
please take a look at the algebra at the bottom of the screen. What professional economists do is a difference in difference estimator. They take the treatment, they take the average air pollution in the counties that were treated after the treatment, after 1971, and they subtract from that the average beforehand, but then they subtract from that the after versus before comparison in the control group because that yields the counterfactual. The key point here is the assumption that the treatment group's path, the time series path in the absence of regulation is revealed by the control group's path. And this is a very general methodology that economists use to estimate treatment effects. Guys, before I go on, can I answer any questions here? Uh, this was the one methodological thing I wanted to teach you. I don't know if Maya gives me a B or a B plus. It's a before versus after comparison for the treatment group versus the control group. We need the control group to get at the counterfactual. What would have been the time series path for the Pittsburghs and the dirty counties if there hadn't been regulation? Folks, can I answer one? John, was, is that a new hand or an old hand? This is a new hand, but uh, I... Uh, there's a helicopter flying up. I'm losing my hearing. Uh, please go ahead. So... In this case, is the control group randomized or is it specifically chosen no. to be cleaner? It is not randomized, and that's a key issue here. I, I, I'd flip what you said, but what you said is correct. The treatment group, those counties assigned to special attention from the Environmental Protection Agency, are chosen because they're polluted. So, John, you should be worried that the whole point of randomization is that the two groups are identical at the baseline, and so you can attribute any subsequent changes to the treatment. But because the Environmental Protection Agency wants to reduce pollution in the most polluted places, it focuses its efforts on polluted places, and that poses a, challenge, a methodological challenge that I think you're thinking about. So John, can I give you 40 more seconds? What are you worried about? So in this case, the issue would be that since the control group doesn't also represent areas that were dirtier at the start, and then there could be other uh, externalities affecting the results here, which would then change how um, the treatment should be viewed if it's effective or not. You, that's an excellent answer. And to pay you a compliment, you're a troublemaker. So you sound like one of these folks at a PhD seminar. I, I mean that as a compliment. It's, um, that's, ex that's exactly the issue. So when the Environmental Protection Agency chose its treatment group and control group, it wasn't trying to help Raj Chetty. It was trying to help people suffering from pollution in Pittsburgh. But the problem with that is we, in a perfect world, we have another Pittsburgh that's identical to Pittsburgh that we don't regulate. And I think that's what John is correctly saying. Guys, now let me tell you about Janet Curry's paper. Ah, I've got two more slides. Yes. So Janet Curry is, is the chairperson of Princeton Economics, and, I, and her paper is a difficult one, and I asked you to take a look at it, and it's directly related to that previous slide. Janet Curry is worried, and Janet Curry and her co-authors are worried that babies in New Jersey are dying early and are, and are having lower birth weights than they would have because they're being exposed to carbon monoxide levels. She is telling a causal story. Janet Curry is a leading health and environmental economist, and she wants to estimate the causal effect of air pollution on babies' health and mortality risk. Folks, can we agree? As an economist, this is a damage function. This is a crucial piece of information for estimating the externality social costs of pollution. And let me explain. Suppose there's some guy in New Jersey driving a dirty vehicle that releases carbon monoxide. Can we agree that guy doesn't want to injure any babies in New Jersey? The intended consequence of his driving a dirty car is he elevates local carbon monoxide levels, and this injures pregnant women who then give birth to babies uh, who are more likely to die because of that exposure and are, are more likely to be born as little babies. And this is very scary stuff. Um, give me one second. Uh, folks, I want to say a couple of things. The brilliance in Janet Curry's paper was the following. She, New Jersey is a state that allows you to get birth records for every mother. The reason this matters is she had the street address of every mother. So folks, think of a map. 
think, think of where you grew up. That's a point on the map. She then collected data on every air pollution monitoring station in New Jersey. So Maya, can I call on you again? In your mind, can you see a map of air pollution monitoring stations and a map of where different pregnant women are living? She then calculated the distance between those two points and she kept in her sample all pregnant women living within six miles of the closest monitoring station. She had data on the mother's age, race, and education. She had data on how many children the, the mother already had. She had data on each birth's birth weight and did the child subsequently die as a baby. And of course, that's a horrible outcome. And folks, what this allows her to do is if there are spikes in air pollution at a nearby carbon monoxide reading, she matches that to the birth records. And her hypothesis is all else to equal, if a pregnant woman is exposed for exogenous reasons to a spike in air pollution that lowers the baby's average birth weight and raises the probability of the baby dying. And so that's in my fourth bullet point slide here. That's what I'm writing down. The hypothesis is that beta is positive. If person J in location L at time T is exposed to more pollution, that that has a causal effect on more on suffering more sickness. If we can estimate this slope coefficient beta, this would inform public policy concerning what the health gains would be for the population if we could regulate air pollution to be lower. Folks, there's no laws of physics in economics. This beta slope can differ across people. Um, teenagers uh, may be less susceptible to pollution. Smokers, Janet Curry documents that smoking women are much more susceptible to carbon monoxide. The goal of the big data economist is to credibly estimate beta. And I believe that Janet Curry did an outstanding job. The piece of empirical work that I found most convincing in Janet Curry's study was the following. She included mother fixed effects, which allowed her, for women who had multiple births, she was able to look at which, uh, if one of your children was born during a time when carbon monoxide was high, how that child's uh, birth weight and probability of dying compares to other children born to the same woman. Folks, here's something that's not in Janet Curry's paper that I want you to think about. I want to talk to you about superheroes. Suppose there's two types of people. There are superheroes who know that they're not susceptible to pollution, and there's just average Joes like Matthew Kahn who are susceptible to pollution. We know from urban economics that home prices are lower, all else equal, in places where it's more polluted. Economic third, fourth bullet point, economic theory predicts that the superheroes will choose to live in the, in the polluted places. So what I'm trying to teach you here is selection effects versus treatment effects and the great work by the Nobel laureate James Heckman. If a superhero knows that she is not susceptible to pollution, then she will move to the polluted place because rents are cheap there. A public health researcher who has not studied economics and assumes that people are randomly assigned to pollution would make the following inference mistake. The sick people are going to live in the low pollution area. The super people who are not susceptible to pollution will live in the high pollution area. And when the researcher runs each person's sickness on their pollution exposure, there won't be a correlation. And the researcher will estimate beta equals zero because the, the supermen have self-selected to be in the polluted place. Folks, is that point clear? It's very important when you study a big data problem and you're interested in a treatment effect to, to think about why were people exposed to pollution in the first place? What were they doing there? And if it's the case that, that, that these superhumans are not susceptible to pollution, this is sort of a joke example, but it's, it's an extreme example to teach you that selection effects can often, where people choose to live, can affect the treatment effects that public health researchers are trying to estimate. Because economists are aware of the impacts of self-selection, we do crazy stuff. Steve Levitt, my friend with Dubner, wrote for economics. I hope you read it. We wait for volcanoes to erupt. We wait for Olympics to take place. We wait for dirty ships to show up in the Los Angeles port. We try to use these exogenous sources of variation to get uh, and then to see how the same people 
To get around the selection issue, we try to use these natural experiments to see how those who chose to be exposed to air pollution, what happens to their health as you clean up air pollution due to the Olympics, or air pollution gets worse due to a volcano or a forest fire or dirty ships arise, arriving. Folks, two last slides and I'm done. Maya, can I go one minute over or do we have a hard stop in one minute? One minute is fine, but... <laughs> um, folks, because we had so much to talk about, I didn't talk that much about water pollution. What happened to African-Americans in Flint, Michigan with the poisoning of the water is very scary stuff. And this is related to the tragedy of the commons and the social costs of activity. What happened in Flint was an underinvestment in infrastructure. And poor cities don't have the tax base to invest in infrastructure. And so another benefit of capitalism and economic development is to have up-to-date infrastructure. A final point I want to tell you about is the work by Hilary Sigmund in Europe. Rivers flow in one direction. So she was studying the Danube. And what she documents in her paper is free riding at international borders, that if a river flows from Germany to Hungary, the Germans have an incentive to put their dirty sites at the border of the nation, because that way all their pollution ends up in Hungary. And so it was a brilliant paper by Hillary that with water, because it flows in one direction, water flows downstream by gravity, um, she documented that countries are putting their noxious facilities so the pollution all ends up on their neighbor and with two chinese buddies of mine we wrote a similar paper in china that i'd recommend that you take a look at my final slide due to the rising access to big data this is an incredibly exciting time to be an environmental economist deep philosophical issues arise in studying the environment will your grandchildren have access to a better environment than we had? What world will we leave them? In my own microeconomics research, I'm fascinated by the causes and consequences of pollution for people, firms, and nations. For those of you with an interest in China, Professor Si Chi Zheng of MIT and I have done extensive research on the rise and decline of pollution in China. And I strongly encourage you to take a look at that work. Maya, thank you very much.